Hi, everyone. My name is Juliet Knowles, and I am an assistant professor of pediatric epilepsy at Stanford University School of Medicine. And I want to thank you for joining me for this session on childhood absence epilepsy and its treatments. So I'll begin this session with a brief review of the definition of epilepsy, which will provide some context when I then tell you about childhood absence epilepsy, including its key features, diagnostic criteria, treatment, and prognosis. I'll then conclude the talk with a brief snapshot of some of the research that has been done and is ongoing to better understand and treat childhood absence epilepsy. So what is epilepsy? Well, epilepsy, of course, is a disease of seizures. And a seizure is an event that happens to someone, whereas epilepsy is an enduring medical condition. A seizure has been defined as a transient occurrence of signs, that is, things that we can observe, or symptoms, that is, things that an individual can report they experienced. And these outward signs or symptoms are due to the inward component of abnormal, excessive, or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. And as this definition implies, there are outward components to seizures that we can see and detect with our eyes and inward components um, that are due to uh, abnormal activity of the brain. And both of these components are important to understand what's happening during an absence seizure. So what then is epilepsy? Well, an epileptic brain is one that um, has an enduring predisposition to have unprovoked seizures. And so formal criteria for epilepsy include having multiple unprovoked seizures or a single seizure, but due to other factors, a very high likelihood of having another seizure in the future. And in some cases, seizures may occur along with other features that add up to an epilepsy syndrome. And childhood absence epilepsy is one of these epilepsy syndromes. Epilepsy is far more common in the pediatric population than most people realize and affects 1% of children worldwide. And in understanding epilepsy and how childhood absence epilepsy fix, fits into the bigger picture of epilepsy, I particularly like this figure from the International League Against Epilepsy, which was published in 2017. And as this figure depicts, there are multiple types of seizures. And the type of seizure that a person has then determines um, what type of epilepsy they are diagnosed with. And in some cases, the epilepsy occurs along with the constellation of features that equates to an epilepsy syndrome. Now, as this figure also depicts, along with multiple types of epilepsy, there are multiple causes for epilepsy, including changes to the structure of the brain, genetic changes, or infectious causes. Today, we're talking about childhood absence epilepsy, and that is thought to result from genetic changes. And as this, fig this figure also importantly shows, epilepsy is not just a disease of seizures. It is also associated with the so-called comorbidities, other important problems, including difficulties with learning, attention, and mood. And these are also important to consider um, when helping individuals with epilepsy. So as I mentioned, there are multiple types of seizures, and the main two categories are focal onset and generalized onset seizures. Focal onset seizures arise from a region of the brain that is delimited to one side of the brain. However, generalized seizures, by contrast, arise from both sides of the brain at once. And we're going to be primarily focused on generalized onset seizures today because absence seizures that occur in childhood absence epilepsy are generalized. How can we tell whether a seizure is focal or generalized? Well, sometimes we can get some clues by watching what happens during the seizure, but oftentimes we need an EEG to be sure whether a seizure is focal or generalized. 
An EEG is a non-invasive test in which electrodes are applied to the scalp in order to detect the electrical activity of the brain. And here I'm showing you one example of um, an EEG with generalized abnormalities that are indicate, indicative of a generalized seizure. And so on this EEG, each line represents the electrical activity from one specific subregion of the brain. And the odd numbers on the EEG represent the left side of the brain, and the even numbers represent regions on the right side of the brain. And while a comprehensive introduction to EEG interpretation is beyond the scope of this session, I think you can appreciate by looking at this EEG that there is an abrupt change in the EEG about here where the EEG switches into a uh, sort of striking spike wave discharge pattern. And those changes are present throughout most regions of the brain, both on the left and the right. And so this is how a generalized seizure, such as an absence seizure, appears. So now let's talk about childhood absence epilepsy. And to tell you about the key features of childhood absence epilepsy, I'm going to begin with a brief, a brief uh, patient vignette. And this is a completely fictional patient, um, but this vignette is informed by my typical experience uh, as a pediatric epileptologist. So a patient named James is uh, brought in by his parents and he is six years old. He is previously healthy and a very uh, bright young boy. However, his teacher has recently become concerned that in class, he is often daydreaming and it's very hard to get his attention. Sometimes she notices that during this daydreaming, he's blinking repetitively. And then uh, yesterday, she summoned the children to line up to go outside for recess. And this is something that James would normally love, but he remained seated at his desk and didn't respond to her requests to get up uh, and line up for recess. And so the question that the parents bring to the clinic is, could James be having absence seizures? Well, to answer that question, let's think about the key features of absence epilepsy. Childhood absence epilepsy is very common. It's about 10 to 20% of all childhood onset epilepsy. And it occurs between the ages of four to eight years typically. So James falls within that age range. And while it occurs slightly more in girls than boys, uh, it can occur in both genders. And how about the seizures? So absence seizures are more subtle than some seizures you might have heard about that involve shaking of the body. Absence seizures, as I mentioned already, are generalized. These are brief but very frequent events. They last 10 to 20 seconds, but they can occur hundreds of times per day. And outwardly, these seizures are manifest by behavioral arrests or what appear to be staring spells. And they're associated with impaired awareness, meaning that the child during this 10 to 20 seconds may be completely unaware of the world around them or partially unaware. Sometimes the staring spell is um, associated with blinking, lip smacking, or non-purposeful movements of the hands that appear sort of like fidgeting. So in James's case, his parents might be wondering whether the frequent daydreaming that his teacher has observed results from a condition such as ADHD, or if those daydreaming spells might actually be absent seizures. And this is a common question that comes up. And one way that we can answer that question is by getting an EEG. And returning to this EEG that I showed you earlier, uh, this is the typical appearance of an absence seizure in childhood absence epilepsy and what we might see on James's EEG. Of course, again, each line here is one region of the brain's electrical activity. The key features are that there is a normal background and then an abrupt shift into this generalized spike wave discharge pattern. And 
typical absence seizures in childhood absence epilepsy have a specific rhythm. So the distance between each of these dark green lines is one second. And you can see that the spikes are occurring about three times per second when the seizure starts. And so absence seizures in childhood absence epilepsy are typically three to four hertz or three to four uh, spikes per second. Another distinctive feature of absence seizures are that they can often be provoked by hyperventilation or rapid breathing. And so sometimes to help diagnose absence seizures, we might ask the child to um, hyperventilate or, for example, blow um, repetitively uh, to make a pinwheel move. So if we saw these findings on James's EEG, given his clinical story that he provided and the EEG together, we could diagnose him with childhood absence epilepsy. And a common question that I get that James's parents might ask is whether any brain imaging is needed um, and whether structural brain problems are likely to be causing these absence seizures. And this is one reason why it's useful to know about epilepsy syndromes. We know that childhood absence epilepsy is not typically associated with structural brain abnormalities. And therefore, we usually do not need to get brain imaging such as a head CT or MRI. So how would we then treat um, James once he was diagnosed with childhood absence epilepsy? Well, the first line medication for childhood absence epilepsy is called ethosuximide. The brand name for this is Zorontin. And uh, this medication is generally very effective in treating absence seizures. The most common side effects that we see with it are um, an upset stomach in some and rarely different types of allergic reactions. Often if the medication is taken with food, then it is very well tolerated. If it is not well tolerated or if it doesn't work to treat the seizures, then um, alternative medications are uh, valproic acid, also known as Depakote, um, and Lamotrigine, also known as Lamictal. And sometimes we can even turn to additional third line medications if needed. Rarely, we uh, diagnose childhood absence epilepsy due to a genetic change in um, one gene called GLUT1. And when this occurs, uh, that form of childhood absence epilepsy is best treated with a specific diet called the ketogenic diet. Another uh, important thing to consider uh, when treating children with absence epilepsy is uh, safety. So we always recommend that uh, the child be supervised closely, for example, when swimming uh, in open water in a pool, um, and that they always wear a helmet when they're riding a bike in case they have a seizure when they're on their bike. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's very important to consider the comorbidities of epilepsy. And 30 to 40% of children with absence epilepsy have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. Um, and they may also have um, mood issues or other learning problems. And so it's very important to screen for this at the beginning and uh, over time so that we can intervene and provide help if the child needs it. Another question that James's parents might ask is what is the prognosis? What should we expect for the future? And fortunately, we would be able to say that 60 to 80 percent of children with childhood absence epilepsy will stop having seizures during adolescence and the medication can be weaned off. Another question that I often get is, I've read about absence seizures in other types of diseases. Do I need to worry about that for my child that was diagnosed with childhood absence epilepsy? So there are other uh, forms of epilepsy that involve absence seizures. These include juvenile absence epilepsy, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Juvenile absence epilepsy and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy tend to occur later in life than childhood absence epilepsy. They have other seizure types associated with them um, and slightly different um, appearance on EEG and different prognoses. They, these two forms of epilepsy persist into adulthood. Lennox-Gastaut syndrome is a more severe type of epilepsy that involves a different type 
of absence seizure called atypical absence seizures. So what research is being done to understand childhood absence epilepsy? Well, much of our understanding of childhood absence epilepsy has been informed by um, animal models. Um, so for example, one well uh, described animal model of absence epilepsy is a mouse that has a mutation in the SCN8A gene. And like other animal models of childhood absence epilepsy, these mice develop spontaneous absence seizures. And uh, these seizures begin um, around day 21 in the mouse, which is sort of like mid-childhood for humans. And the seizures become more frequent over time, similar happen to what happens in children with untreated or medication resistant seizures. And animal models such as these have enabled us to really dissect and understand the brain regions and brain networks that give rise to absence seizures. And thanks to this research, we understand that seizures arise from a absence seizures arise from a specific brain network called the thalamocortical brain network. And this is comprised of this deep structure in the brain called the thalamus and its connections to the overlying cortex of the brain in the front and middle regions of the brain. And these, region, these regions are interconnected by uh, white matter tracts called the internal capsule and corpus callosum that enable seizures to spread rapidly throughout the brain. And that is why they appear generalized. Now, research in animals and in children with absence epilepsy have enabled us to further understand the genetic causes of this disease. And we now know that rarely um, absence epilepsy results from changes in single genes, some of which are listed here. However, in many cases, we think that absence epilepsy is genetic, but it results from changes in multiple genes. And this is one ongoing area of research. And my lab at Stanford University has recently been studying how neurons or information transmitting cells in the brain interact with other cell types called glia to uh, promote seizure progression in the setting of absence epilepsy. And we specifically found that absent seizures from neurons induce oligodendrocytes to produce more myelin within the seizure network. And that this extra myelination or insulation in the seizure network promotes further seizures. And this is just one example of uh, many exciting efforts that are going on to better understand and treat absence epilepsy. So with that, I would like to thank you and I'd like to provide these resources uh, that informed my talk. And um, I think these are reliable resources uh, for information if you'd like to learn more about epilepsy or childhood absence epilepsy. I'd like to thank Cure Epilepsy for allowing me to speak on the topic of childhood absence epilepsy. Next, I have the pleasure to introduce you to a patient of mine, Francine Ung and her mother, Ivy, who will tell you about Francine's journey with childhood absence epilepsy. Hi, um, my name is Trenchin Ang. I was diagnosed with epilepsy at the age of seven, and I would like to thank Cure Epilepsy and Dr. Knowles for this opportunity. I was diagnosed with absence seizure, and I had around 50 to 100 daily. I couldn't focus. It was really hard for me to learn. I couldn't run, like do any most physical activity. I was limited to. I just had to sit it out. And sometimes when I was with my friends, I even had seizures then. Having seizures in front of other people, it was really a problem because, you know, I just blacked out in front of them. And it would be like, why, why did she just black out in front of me? And it would lower my confidence by a lot because I was constantly scared of this happening. And that was a huge problem for me. I was really limited to what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed. Like I couldn't do those stuff because I could have had a seizure and hurt myself. I once had a violin recital and I had a seizure on the stage. I think that's when I started to get really concerned about it. 
absence seizure for me and other people, it's not like daydreaming. It's not always staring off into space. For me, I have action. Uh, my hands move, I scratch my eyes, my eyelids flutter. Um, I actually hum when I have a seizure. So it's, it's different for everyone. And when I'm having a seizure, it's like a, a part of my day gets taken out. And when I try to remember what happened while I was having a seizure, I can't think of anything. Like my brain shuts down. Since I've had seizures, I've been to the doctor twice every year and I've gone through at least five drugs, five medicine. And I've had a lot of um, symptoms and side effects from the medicines that I take. Like sometimes I get a really bad attitude, mood swings. Um, like I, I get really tired and then I get really energetic and it just doesn't make sense, but I'm thinking that it's because of my medicine. For the last year, now that I've been taking medicine daily, I have been seizure free. I don't feel limited to doing any physical activity. I'm completely good. I'm able to focus and learn. Um, it's easy for me. I'm on top of all my grades and I think that taking medicine has helped me a long way. More treatment and research for absence epilepsy could help me and others reach our goal of no seizures and no side effects.